It is recording. Cool. Hi, everyone. Welcome to CU Data Week. I'm Lala Grau. I'm a research instructor at the Center for Innovative Design and Analysis. We have had a bunch of talks this week, and after this one, we'll have two more. Um, a primer on machine learning in R tonight and basic statistics in R tomorrow at noon. So feel free to join us for each lecture that you attend. You're entered into a raffle for an iPad, a Garmin watch, or wireless earbuds. So that's exciting. Um, I'm going to share the link to the attendance in a second. But I'd love to introduce Wyatt. Wyatt is also a research instructor here at Zeta. And he's our go-to person whenever we want to make cool figures. Wyatt is the person to go to. Um, so Wyatt, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, thanks, Lala. Uh, thanks for introducing me. Um, thank you to everyone who is joining the talk. Um, I'm excited to have you. Um, I hope you come out of this with a little uh, more confidence and experience in creating figures in art. Um, yeah, I'm going to start sharing my presentation. Um, okay. Uh, okay, can everyone see, is it in presenter mode now? Okay, so yes, um, this is the figures in our talk. Um, I'm Wyatt Turner. Um, you know, uh, if just as like a, you know, a brief um, kind of like overview, if you have questions, um, Feel free to unmute and ask at any point. Um, I'm not, it's not super easy for me to see what happens in the chat box. So I may not notice them. Um, just I as can like moderate a, for you. I can. Okay, yeah, that'd be yeah. great. Um, yeah, whenever you're screen sharing, it's just hard to see. Um, but yeah, you know, if you have questions, just feel free to throw them my way. I don't want this to be like super duper formal. Um, so yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, kind of an agenda. Um, we're just gonna kind of go over like an overview of just basic data visualization. Um, then we're gonna go and compare um, like base R, so not using any like special packages, just like the figures you can create in base R um, versus ggplot, which is a package that um, I use a ton. And then I'm gonna briefly touch on sjplot, which is a nice alternative. Um, I don't use it quite as often as ggplot, but you know, I think it's just a nice, uh, nice alternative to have in your back pocket. And then I'm just going to go through a lot of examples of different things you can do um, with ggplot and sjplot. Um, you know, because I think that helps me a lot, um, just like seeing what you can do and then having the code as like an example. But yeah, uh, so yeah, you know, just like as like just a very basic overview. This is not comprehensive, but you know, if you want to look at like associations between like variables, you can do like scatter plots, line plots. Um, you can do um, what are called alluvial plots, which is a fun plot that uh, we'll kind of cover. Um, you can do heat maps. Um, if you want to look at like how variables are distributed, which is just usually like, one variable, you can do like histograms, density plots, uh, violent plots, you know, bo um, box plots. And then if it's just like purely descriptive, you can do bar plots. Um, and these are all things that we'll cover in the talk. Um, so within R, kind of the basics, uh, and I'm sure I'm sure this has been touched in some of the other talks, but just the basics is um, your data, it can be in several different types in R. You can have um, a matrix or a vector. Um, you can have a data frame, which is preferable for um, a lot of these packages. And then you can have um, what's called a tibble, which is very similar to a data frame. Um, those also work totally fine um, with these packages. I, I found that tibbles have um, some issues with some packages, um, but you know, data frame or tibble are usually pretty good. Matrix doesn't always want to work. Um, yeah. Then the variables, you know, you can essentially have like categorical variables, so you know they're binned into different categories, um, or you can have like continuous variable, like something like age. Um, so yeah, and then the formats, um, you can have wide data, which is, you know, every single um, like row is like all the, all the, like if you have like repeat visits, all like repeat visits are contained in a single row um, and it's like wide. Um, or you can have um, long where each like repeat visit is its own row. Um, and you'll have like some sort of identifier, like visit number one, two, three, four. Um, so that's like important. Um, ggplot definitely prefers long format for most of the uh, plots that you can make. Um, and then 
we'll go over the functions um, that these packages use, the kind of the input syntax, um, you know, like what, what you need to put within like, um, for example, the ggplot calls. Um, and then there's some, some functions you have like required input um, and others you have optional uh, input. And that'll really, you know, the optional stuff is where you can kind of make some cool, interesting changes. Um, yeah, and then we'll go over the output, which in this instance is like the plots. Um, yeah, so a lot of what I'm going to be doing um, is using this built-in data set in R Studio. Uh, it's called the Mount Cars data set. Um, and I just took like a screenshot of the variables in it. Um, it's something that like isn't um, maybe particularly interesting, but uh, it's something that any of you can access. You don't have to have this data, like it's built into R. So you'll be able to just download this code and run it and use this data set, um, no problem at all, which I think is helpful because if like you're new to R, um, you won't have to like figure out how to import this data and make sure that everything's correct. It's just built in. Um, yeah, so we'll kind of go over base R. And when I say base R, I just mean like it's, you don't have to um, install or load any new packages. It's just like what's already built into like R. Um, and I work within like R Studio, like most people use R, but um, it's just already built in. And so one of like the main the main function is just plot, which you know pretty self explanatory. Um, and for most plots, you just like put in like what variables are like your x variables, what variables are your y variables, um, and then there's kind of like build ons to it. Like points um, is when you want to like create like a scatter plot. Um, lines is when you want to make like lines. Um, and histogram is shockingly when you or hist is when you want to make histograms. Um, so the pros of base R is that it's pretty simple to understand and use. Um, you know, it's it's you know you just put in your x and your y, and then that's about it. Um, the cons is that it's harder to like augment. Like if you want to make like um, changes to the colors of the points or to the you know titles, or if you want to add like multiple things, um, it's just more difficult. And some things it's just not capable of doing. Um, the code. In my opinion, it just gets kind of clunky when you have a lot of things, and we'll kind of go over some examples. And the actual output of the plots is kind of like bland. Uh, it doesn't, I've heard people describe it as like, um, it's so simple that it's brutal, <laughs> which um, to me is not like very, I mean, the point of a plot is to be interesting to look at. So I'm not a big fan of it. Um, kind of the meat of this talk will be on ggplot, which is a package. Um, it comes from the tidyverse. Um, suite of packages, um, and it's 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 great. I'm biased. I use it all the time, but it's great. Um, the main function you use is ggplot, um, and you input your data, and then what they call the AES, the aesthetics call. That's where you'll put like your x variable, your y variable, and then you add on other calls like geom point, geom line, geom histogram. There's a ton of them. Um, the pros is it's incredibly flexible. You can do so many cool things. I've seen people make like the coolest plots in the world with ggplot. Like I've made some like what I think are pretty cool plots. Like you can make like a map of the US if you want it. I've done that before. Um, it's very cool. Um, the format is like pretty generalized for all these different graph types. Like if you make a scatter plot versus like a, you know, a map, um, the format's like basically the same. It's just the call is different. Um, it's really easy to create these complex figures. You can customize the themes. Um, the cons is that the learning curve is a little higher. Um, and the syntax uh, is something that like you probably will not always remember. I have to Google a lot of things um, oftentimes, which is totally fine. But there's just like a lot of a lot of sub functions and calls that you you know you may not remember necessarily. Um, and then the next one we're gonna kind of go over is sjplot, and the main function in that is plot underscore, which is similar to base R. And for example, you can do like plot underscore model if you want to like do like a forest plot of uh, some regression model, um, plot scatter, plot frequency for like um, kind of histograms. Um, pros is that it's fairly flexible, um, not as flexible as ggplot. It's similar format for these graph types, um, pretty quick to make like complicated figures. I'll show you, like you'll, we'll go over this, but like you can make some like, like it'll just spit out some nice figures really quickly. You don't have to like do much. Um, there's less syntax and the learning curve is a little gentler than ggplot. The cons is it's not as modifiable, like you can't do quite as many things, and it's not as widely used. Um, ggplot, like everyone uses it, so you get a, like a lot of nice, like 
build-ons to it, um, and we'll go over one of those. People don't use SJplot as much in R. Um, so yeah. So this is like a base R example of a scatter plot. Um, I have the code right there. Um, I'm not going to like dig into it too too deep, but you can see that it's you just specify like um, what you want the x axis variable to be, what you want the y axis variable to be, and then the labels um, like x label, y label. Um, so it's pretty simple. I'll just spit out something like this, which is pretty you know bare bones. Um, a ggplot example. Um, so we use that ggplot call, then we put mount cars, which is our data set, um, into it. And then we specify in that AES call what we want the X and Y variables to be. So it looks somewhat similar to base R, um, but just like an extra step with that AES call, which is gonna be like very important. And then the next important part is this, this plus right here. So the way that I think of it is this ggplot call, you're essentially loading your data in but you're not doing anything beyond that. It's just like, here's like my data in like the plot, but I'm not saying like what I want to do after that. You have to do these plus um, pluses to basically say like what you want to add on. It's like you're adding on extra layers. So in this example, you're doing plus and you're doing geom point, which is the call to like, you know, make a point. Um, so as you, and then you do plus labs to do like a label, like a title for it. So as you can see, it spits out this plot, which, um, you know, isn't super fancy. I haven't done like a ton with it, but you can kind of compare it to the base R. Um, yeah, and so here's another base R example where I do a bit more um, to make it look cooler, prettier. Um, the call equals line right here. Um, that's just basically me saying like I want colors based on like the number of like gears in the data set. Um, so that's how we get those colorings. Um, and then the legend you have to add to like add on like um, modifications to this legend because otherwise it would kind of put out like a, a not super fun um, legend name. Um, but yeah, so this is what it looks like. As you can see, like it's a bit of code to create and it looks kind of like it's kind of hard to like follow. Um, with the ggplot example, you can do some more things. Um, so again, we have that same ggplot call where we load in the data. Then we have the AES call, and that's the same. Like, you know, we're saying miles per gallon's on the X axis, weight is on the uh, Y axis. And then we say, like, we want the color of the of the points to be based on. So again, like, I'm just saying, like, based on the gear number. And you, I added in this factor call to make it um, in R what we call factors, because um, otherwise it would make it this kind of continuous scale, which isn't really um, great um, all the time. And then you can also change the size of the points. So I did that based on the, the carburetor. Um, so yeah. And then I added the geom point, um, you know, and you can also add in to like these um, sub calls, like the same thing, like you can do AES and then like size equals factor carb um, if you want to make modifications within them, which we can kind of, we'll go over some of those. And then I just did like the labels. And so you can see like, this is a nicely colored plot. like. I don't have to do like a ton to change the legend or uh, very much. All I have to do is in this labs, like whatever the color is, I say like, I want the legend title to be for that like gear number. And same thing for the size, I want it to be like carburetor. So that changes this legend to be like titled carburetor and gear number, um, because otherwise the default would be factor gear and factor carb, which isn't fun to like read. Like it wouldn't make sense to a lot of people. Um, but yeah, so you get this um, output where it's colored by two different things, or it's colored by um, one level, one variable, and it's sized by another, which can be nice because you can just have like multiple layers. Um, and then here's an SJplot example. Um, as you can see, the syntax is pretty similar to base R. Um, you're just loading in your data, like mount cars. You're just specifying what the two variables are, and then you're grouping um, variable. That'll color it. So I just said group based on gear, kind of similar to the other plot. And you can see the output looks pretty similar to ggplot, um, but it does have limitations. Um, it can't do like a lot of the uh, things that ggplot can. Like you can't do like um, sizing as easily. You can't specify colors as easily. Um, but it is um, it's definitely a step up from base R, and it's a lot faster than ggplot. Like just if you want something really quick. Um, so here's a. Um, I think this is helpful. This is an example of a scatter plot where you add on like a some sort of like regression line. And you can see the, you know, again, the syntax is very similar um, to what we saw before. We just do like we load in the data in this ggplot call. We say we want a point. 
And then you just see this geom smooth and it'll just overlay a, a line on your scatter plot, which is really nice, really easy. Um, if you wanna do something a little fancier, um, if you wanna basically create um, like regression lines by like the grouping. So this time I use like, what is like the regression line based on the carburetor number? It's pretty similar. Um, the only difference is now we're doing this group um, grouping level. And we're just saying like, we want to group based on the carburetor number. Um, you know, we do this geom uh, point call again. Then within the geom smooth, we're going to see like a lot of uh, things that I kind of change. Instead of just like leaving it as geom smooth and nothing else, I added in like the method. This is just a normal linear regression. The default is a lowest uh, uh, regression, which um, is a little different. Uh, well, a lot different, honestly. Um, I take out like the standard error around these because it kind of gets clunky if you do that with multiple. Um, and then within this AES call, because again, you can add like the AES call to any of these sub like geom smooth functions. I just colored by like the carburetor. Um, so that way we get these different colored lines. The line type I also did by the carburetor. So that's why we get different like, you know, line types like they're dashed or not. Um, and yeah, and so you get like a plot that has like different lines for these different groups, which can be, you know, can be helpful and interesting. Um, and it's just a nice quick way of just visualizing regression. And then again, like this labs, uh, my added just to be like the color um, is based on carburetor and the line type is based on carburetor. And you can see that it combines it on this legend. If you don't do that, they'll actually, uh, sometimes it'll split it. So you'll have like two legends, which isn't always great. Um, yeah. And then here's the SJ plot example. So again, I think it's it's like a lot faster than GD plot to use, but the issue is um we can't do like line types on this one. Um as you can see, like they're all like, you know, they're not dotted or dashed. Um, so you can't do line types, but it is pretty um pretty nice. And you know, the only difference from the plot scatter that I showed you before is this fit.groups. And that'll just say, like, I want to fit a regression, um, this LM. Um, based on the grouping variable. So that's what it'll do. If you don't specify fit.groups, um, if you just do like fit, it would just create like one regression line, not by the groups. Um, so yeah. So the, here's um, a pretty quick example of like a histogram in ggplot. Um, the call is genome histogram. And a lot of these will kind of feel redundant, um, but I just like really want to hammer home if you get like the basic syntax of ggplot down, you can make these all like very easily. So you load in your data. The difference in this one is um, you don't have a Y variable because it's a, a distribution of one variable. So you're just saying like, I want to look at just miles per gallon. Then you do um, genome histogram and you'll see there's some calls in here um, that I added. Um, bins just basically change, like it determines how many bins you'll have, like how many of these bars. If I set it at like 20, you'd have 20. Um, so you can kind of specify that manually um, for more like granularity. Um, I did the fill equals light blue to make them, I think the default is just this dark gray color that's not very fun to look at. Um, so yeah, like I did light blue and then color I did black. So when you're doing um, plots where it's not like a point or a line, you'll use fill to kind of like fill in. I kind of think it was like Microsoft Paint where you use like, like you create like a circle and then you fill it in. You use fill for that. And then if you're interested, you can use color to do like the outline. If I had done like color equals light blue and just not put fill, it would have just made these like light blue around the outside and the inside would have remained that gray, which isn't very fun to look at. Um, yeah, so another really handy, powerful part of ggplot is um, this faceting uh, option that you can use. And so this is the same, um, same plot that I showed you. The only difference is I split it up by cylinder so this part of the code right here is the exact same. Well, I changed the bin number to 15, um, but everything else is the same. But now I split it up by cylinder and you use this facet grid and there's also a facet wrap call. Um, but all it is, if it's just like one variable, you just do a period, a tilde, and then you do like the other variable name. So all this did was just split it up by cylinder number. So that can be nice if you wanna look at like something, uh, like a distribution of a variable um, split up by like different, a different level. Um, so you can kind of compare like how does like miles per gallon compare by like the cylinder and you can see that like a four cylinder seems to have much better miles per gallon, which makes sense. I mean, um, and an eight cylinder seems to be a lot worse. Um, so yeah, facet grid is very powerful and facet wrap. There's two of them. Um, 
So yeah, then there's, you can do like coloring by different, like an even another variable. So this is like the same plot, except now I filled each of these by the carburetor number. So now we get like an extra layer of uh, granularity, which can be really nice. You know, now we can look at like within like, you know, these four cylinders, how does like the carburetor number impact the miles per gallon? And then same thing for six cylinders and eight cylinders. And we can see um, it doesn't seem to have, it doesn't seem to like really make a huge difference, um, you know, however many carburetors the car has. Um, this is just another um, general example of uh, just a, a bar plot. So this is more like descriptive. Um, so this one takes a little bit more manipulation um, and compared to SJ plot, it's kind of not as good. We'll kind of go over that, um, an example of that in the next slide. But again, the basic syntax is you just load in your data and then you use this geom bar call. And again, we use like the AES call within it if we want to make like extra modifications. And all I'm doing in this one is I'm just saying like, I want the Y output to be the proportion. Um, and then you can, the nice thing about ggplot is you can specify the colors directly. So you can see, like I just said, I want you to fill in these like three gear types, red, orange, and yellow. Um, and I think pretty much like all the basic colors are, you just put them in quotations. Like I could have done like green, you know, brown, et cetera. Fancier things, um, it's not gonna recognize. Like, I think if you tried like neon green or neon pink, if you wanted to color it that, it wouldn't work. Um, but you could look up like the hexadecimal codes um, for those and put those in um, quotations. I do that sometimes if I want like a very specific color, but you do have to like figure out what that hexadecimal code is. Um, and I don't, I mean, I would not imagine many people know those off the top of their heads. Um, Can yes, I interrupt that, you with a question, Wyatt? Sure. Uh, we have a question in the chat box. Can you talk a little bit more about the two dots versus the one dot, i.e. in geom underscore bar? The two dot versus the one dot. Um, can you? In that like second line of code, GM bar AES Y equals dot dot prop. I think that's oh why. okay. This this part right here. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So actually, um, this has been deprecated. Uh, so it is the code that I uploaded is more current. But all this is saying this is like a built-in like um like function in ggplot that's basically saying like what do I want the Y to be? I want it to be like the proportion for this um. This like, like of the overall, like as we can see, like these three proportions, it's just like what proportion of the total is like gear for. But like dot dot prop is just saying like, instead of like manually calculating that proportion, just like built in, like what's the proportion for these three gear types? Um, so that way you don't have to do like any extra like data wrangling or manipulation because this data set like Mount Cars, it doesn't automatically have like the proportion for that. So you have to specify like that. Now they changed it. It's after underscore stat and then parentheses prop. Um, so it is a little different. That's you, this, I don't know. ggplot likes to deprecate things um, fairly often, which can be kind of frustrating. Um, but this code still works. It's just you'll get like a warning call and it'll be like, oh, like this is deprecated. Use this instead. But it still works to find, fine. fine. Um, but yeah, that's all that dot dot pop is doing. Did that help, Matt? Hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. It's good to know that it's replaced by like stat underscore prop two. Thank you. Yeah. And then, um, yeah. And so like this first geom bar call is just creating like the actual bar plot or uh, yeah, bar plot. This next like geom text is actually adding the uh, text to it. And the call is pretty similar. I mean, it's geom text. As you can see, it's AES and everything looks similar. The only difference is this label is like this label call is what's saying like, hey, like, add the text like this is like what we want the text to be if you left that blank i think it would throw an error back or nothing would pop up but like label equals is like this is what i want the text to be and in this case it's like we want the text to be like the you know proportion of this um and as you can see we use that dot dot prop and i rounded it i used the round function to just be two digits otherwise it would have been like a lot of digits and not fun to look at um the only thing to keep in mind when you do that is it'll actually put it where exactly where you say like the Y equals. So this, if you didn't modify it, this 0.47 would be like right on this line, um, which isn't fun to look at. So you can use this VJust call to modify it. And you just say VJust equals, and in this case, I use negative 0.5 and it'll just bump it up a little. There's also H just, which is horizontal adjustment. So it'll just like move it left or right. 
Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And then I added this scale Y continuous call because I just wanted to shrink it down a little because there's just a lot of like dead space um, up here. Uh, so I just wanted to make it a little easier to compare these like directly. Um, and that's one way of doing it is like the scale continuous and you just say like, here's what I want the limits to be from zero to 0 0.6 instead of the default would have been zero to one. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is the SJ bar plot example. So if I'm gonna be honest, I think this is actually a lot better um, in many regards. It's a lot cleaner, it's a lot simpler. All you do is load in the data, you say like what variable you wanna do, and then you can specify the color. Um, and it'll give you like a plot just like this, you know? Um, it'll give you the percentage, the count for each of these, and it's very quick, very fast. Um, the only, I guess the only downside is you can't color in based on like, each individual level. So in the plot before I had like red, orange, yellow for each, you know, like each gear type had a specific color. This one, you can only do like one color for all of them. So that can be a downside, but it is very quick and it takes a lot less effort to get the um, like text. Like you don't have to do anything, which that can be very nice um, if you just want to make something quick and simple. Um, so this one is a bit, uh, a bit fancier. Um, again, it's still like kind of a descriptive plot. Um, this first part is uh, this mutate function. This is me just doing um, a lot of like data management to get uh, basically what I'm doing is like for each of these cars, I'm calculating their Z score for miles per gallon. So basically how far or uh, above or below the average they are. Um, and then I just plot it. And so um, you can see like, it's pretty, it's pretty like interesting, like how much you can like do um, with this. Like, I think this is like a very, like you can see that a, uh, Toyota Corolla is just great gas mileage so far above the average, which if you've had a Corolla, I don't think that's surprising. Um, you know, they're great little cars. And then like, if you have like a Cadillac Fleetwood, that thing's just guzzling your gas. Um, but it's just a very like nice visualization um, of information. But again, like the kind of the syntax is the same as always. We have this GG plot. We're just saying like, here's like, you know, X axis is car name, Y axis is this Z score variable I created. Um, and then like the label, um, cause if you didn't label it, um, it would be uh, a little a little less uh, nice to look at. Um, and then he uses geom bar um, call, which, you know, again is uh, just, it, it takes like two or just takes some, um, yeah, two, rather than the histogram, the geom histogram, it takes two values. Um, so it's not quite a distribution um, like geom histogram. There's also a geom call, which is similar. It's a, hist or a distribution type uh, output, but um, you fill based on like the miles per gallon. Um, you can specify like how far apart you kind of want these um, bars to be with the width. Um, and then you, uh, I use a scale fill manual um, to specify like the colors of the filling. Um, and I named it mileage and I did like uh, above average, below average. So basically if they were above like zero, they were above average if they were below, you know, and then this values. Um, so the actual name of that variable, the fill, the MPG type, um, it had above and below. So here you can specify like the colors you want exactly in this call. So you could do like, I want above to be, um, in this case, these are the hexadecimals. I wanted to kind of give like an example of it, uh, but you could have just done like green and red. The red the red would have been like a more scarlet red if you specified just like red. Um, but like, you can just like use like the, the values, the levels of that like variable you're filling on to color it. And you can also do it with scale color manual so this is one way of just like specifying colors directly, which can be really nice um, if you just want a particular color or if you're doing a color palette that has to align with the journal um, standard. And then I use this labs again, which this is just kind of how you label like everything in the plot. Um, so the title, you know, and then you can do like a subtitle, which can be nice. Um, you can modify it a lot. Um, yeah, it's pretty nice. And then one thing um, that I did change in this is I use this theme call. Um, and so sometimes you'll like they like all these plots have like defaults um, as far as like size um, for text. And sometimes like as you can see like um, on this uh, and I did this coordinate flip. So this is why it says uh, like, you know, axis text Y. Um, but as you can see, like there's a lot of names here. And if you don't change the size, like they'll just overlap and you can't read it. It'd be like 
you know, Ferrari Dino would just be like merged with Mazda RX4 and you wouldn't be able to read it. So you can use this like at this theme call and you can do like, this is where you do most of like your text um, manipulation. But this like call like access.text.y is just saying like the text on the Y axis. Um, and then you say like what you want to do with it and you'll use this element text a lot. And in this case, I just changed the size to seven. Um, sometimes you have to play around with it. Like you'll have to like rerun the plot to like actually determine like what the sizing will look like. Cause um, this like size, I believe it corresponds um, basically to like the size you'd see like in like um, like a Word doc. But if you like, if you have these, if, if you're making these plots like on a bigger monitor, sometimes the sizing will just get kind of goofy and you'll have to just like eyeball it basically. Um, so yeah, it's supposed to be a ratio of like basically the size of the image. Um, and it's not like, this isn't like seven like inches or something. Um, so that's something that, you know, you will have to play around with. Um, yeah, but then I use this like coordinate flip to just basically flip like the X and Y axes. So it looked a little cleaner because before it didn't look as nice. Um, so here's like another kind of example of a distribution um, that's pretty simple to do. You can just use geom density. I like doing um, density plots a little more than histograms sometimes, just because uh, they look a little cleaner. Um, you, I don't know, in the, the histogram, sometimes you have to specify the, the bin number and it can just get kind of difficult to make something that looks like actually like, you know, reflective of the data. The density plot will like calculate that automatically. So sometimes it's nice. Um, but yeah, but again, the call is just, it's basically the same as a geom histogram. It's just geom density. I did add in this one new call called alpha. Alpha is how you control um, basically the, like the deepness of the color. Like if you set an alpha of like 0.5, you can see that we can kind of like see through it a little. If you set it at like zero, like there would be no color. It would just essentially disappear. The default is to set alpha. Like it, if you don't specify it, it'll just be one and every color will just be like vibrant and deep. Um, but yeah, that's like something that you, you can use a lot. And I'll kind of go over that in the next slide. So in this one, um, you can see I did, uh, that have like these overlapping density plots. So like we're combining some things that we've gone over already. Um, you know, again, we're loading in our data, same as we always do. We're filling it based, like the color is based on the carburetor. And then I'm doing the, you know, geom density with an alpha of 0.5. So if I hadn't done an alpha of 0.5, um, the things that are behind say like this blue um, distribution, you wouldn't have been able to see them. They would have been covered up by it, um, which isn't very helpful. So that's when alpha comes into play. Um, and then I added in this um, kind of fancier facet uh, that you can do. So the nice thing about faceting is um, you can do these like relational um, statements. So rather than just splitting up by like cylinder number, which as you can kind of remember, it was four, six, and eight. I did it based on um, cylinders that were greater than six. So we can see it splits into eight cylinder versus four and six cylinder. So that can be very helpful. Like you can do these like relational statements within the faceting. And then this labeler part, um, I included this um, because it's something that people run into quite frequently with faceting. It's hard to change the labels, like this portion right up here, like where it says eight cylinder and four and six. So I included this um, code. And essentially, you're just saying, like, I want the labeler to change because when you do a, like a relational like this, it'll just default to like, it would have been true versus false. So it was like, if they're above six, it's true. If they're below six, it's false. So here we can see I'm changing true, that value to be four and six cylinder, and then false to be eight cylinder, um, which I think I might have had that backwards when I wrote this. Uh -huh. <laughs> so yeah. Um, but it's very handy to have this because you can change the labels and faceting, which is like something that people like run, like I used to run into this problem all the time before I found this like uh, fix around, but just make sure like your labels are correct. Cause if I'm, I'm thinking about this now and I think I have this backwards. So um, this might be four and six cylinder and this is eight cylinder. So um, yeah, so here's another um, example of kind of like a uh, distribution, but I added some extra things that, um, I think people like are curious on quite often. So basically everything up until like uh, like the 
labs like X label um, line. It's what we've seen before. We're loading in data. What's like the AES, like the, you know, I'm saying the dispersion on the Y axis. Um, X is like this, you know, gear number. And then I'm filling based on gear number. So everything else, like everything's like something we've seen. The only difference is we're using Geom Violin, which is similar to Geom Box Plot, um, but people like violin plots too. Um, but down here, I made some changes, which I think um, are helpful because people ask about like how you do this quite often. So we use this theme call and theme is very powerful. You can do a lot within it. And then I just specified text um, that just, it's applying to all the text in this, um, which is nice. And you know, you use this element text on the right side. And so I changed the, the font, that's this family call um, to serif. Um, there's a lot of options in it. Um, I'm not sure what the default um, in ggplot is actually, um, but you can change the family pretty easily. Um, you will have to like um, make sure that the family name is like correct, like what ggplot wants to take in. Um, I don't, I think if you tried like Times New Roman, like uh, you'd have to, it's not Times New Roman, it's something a little different. Um, so you just have to make sure that this is correct, but you can change like the font, which people like is really great. Um, you can change the size of the text uh, like across the whole graph. Um, the color, I made it like gray. Um, and then like the face, I made it italic. Um, so there's bold, um, bold dot italic, italic, and then just the default. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think the normal text looks somewhat bold anyway. Um, I would not recommend trying bold dot italic. It looks kind of terrible. Um, but yeah, like the default text is nice, but if you want to italicize it, it's great. Or if you want to make it bold, it's great. Um, bold dot italics, I'm not a fan of, but that's just me personally. Um, and so here's like an example of kind of this like line plot that's more like longitudinal. Um, and this one, uh, it's, it's nice because it'll just like basically like auto connect it if you use the geom line call. Um, but in this one, like I'm just putting in this like stock market data um, over time and then whatever the closing price was for like these different like European stock indices. Um, and, you know, you just use like geom line and it'll just create this like nice like line plot. It's like a, you know, basically like a time series, um, which can be nice for like for some research, you know, like you'll deal with like sort of like longitudinal or time series data, which this is just a nice, easy way to visualize it um, in my experience. And again, like I just I really want to hammer home like the the syntax is uh, the same across like all these different um, different plots, you know, like you load in the data the same. And then the only thing that really changes is like the geom underscore call. So in this one is geom line. If I'd done geom point, it would have been a scatter plot, which wouldn't have been very like fun to look at, but you can like add on the points to this if you're interested in that, uh, which is a little, a little fancier, but yeah. And then this is like a similar plot, um, but instead of geom line, it's using geom underscore area. Um, but yeah, everything else is the exact, well, and then fill, because you're filling it now rather than coloring it. Um, but everything else is the same. And this is just a different way of like visualizing like the same type of information. It's like the, the area under those, like how they compare to each other. Um, so uh, actually last year when I did this talk, um, someone emailed me afterwards and they were interested in creating a forest plot um, from like a regression model. Um, which isn't something that I had done before, but it's pretty easy to do um, in ggplot. And then I'll go over, uh, it's even easier to do an sjplot, and I'll go over an example of that. But here's some code. If like you do a regression um, of whatever variety, this is just a linear regression, and this model is just totally arbitrary. Um, you know, I just kind of threw some variables in there. Um, but um, after you create your model and, you know, you store it, um, you can use this broom, um, this tidy function from the broom package. And what this does is it turns it into like a data frame because normally in R, when you create like a model, it stores a, a, a model object, which doesn't play nice with a lot of other things. Um, but so this part right here is just like basically taking your model and turning it into like a data format that ggplot will accept. Um, and then from there, it's pretty easy. You just, you know, use ggplot. You say like what your uh, terms are. Um, in this case, uh, you know, it's like the different like predictors in the model. Um, and then uh, you just put like Y, like for your estimates, like what the actual regression output is. And then you use these two new calls, Y min and Y max. And so those are just the confidence uh, intervals um, for the plot. Um, and again, these are like all stored in this like uh, data frame after you tidy it. Um, and then you use these new calls, you use geom point range. 
So what that does is it basically takes this Y, Y min, Y max, and it creates this handy little uh, output where it's a line for the, you know, the basically the range of that. And it, it wouldn't have to necessarily be like a regression output. You could use it for like anything, um, frankly. And then like the Y um, input is just a dot. So this just creates a nice forest plot. And then I added this geom H line. So there's geom H line and there's geom V line. And that's how you add like, you know, like basically like vertical lines and horizontal lines. Um, and I just said, put like the Y intercept at zero um, so we can see if it's like significant or not. And then I just said, let's make it a dashed line rather than a straight dark line. And then I flipped it. So it was a little easier to read these um, levels. Um, so that's why like it says H line, but it looks like a vertical line. That's because it ended up getting flipped. But this is like a, a pretty quick way of doing a forest plot. However, I'm going to show you the SJ plot version, which is quite frankly way better. Um, so SJ plot, same thing. We make our data or like our model, um, same model. And now we just use plot underscore model and we put in our model and then you can specify like what you want the, you know, vertical line to be. Um, and I just said like black, um, you have to specify this or there won't be one. Um, and then you can do show dot values equals true. And this will put like the regression uh, estimates as well as like their significance. Um, so as you can see, these are all significant. Again, this our model is just totally arbitrary, but like they all like none of them touch zero. Um, there's differing degrees of significance. As we can see, like this one is closer to zero. So that P value is probably um, higher than these. Um, but yeah, and then you can do, you use this value dot offset um, to basically nudge these because Similar to ggplot, the default is to make them like right on top, which doesn't look super nice. But this is a lot easier, a lot faster than doing it the ggplot way. Um, so I guess like sjplot is just nice for doing like quick things that are just very like generic. You can't do quite as much modification on them. And some things you just can't do as far as like modifying them. But it is just very like quick um, and very nice. I mean, if you were to do this entire process in ggplot, it would be a lot more code. and it would look about the same, um, but it would just be like a lot more code. So, um, so here is um, one of the reasons I think ggplot is uh, preferential to sjplot is you have like a lot of um, like add-on packages. So this is an example of uh, an add-on package called ggalluvial, and it creates um, what's called an alluvial plot, which I think refers to like the way that like sands um, in like a river like you know flow. Um, and I just think of this as kind of like a flow diagram, but basically like you can set these different um, strata and it will tell you how people flow between strata, which can be nice for like a lot of things. Um, like, you know, I think especially longitudinal type projects, um, you know, if you want to visualize like how people are changing over time. Um, so yeah, this is just a great plot and it follows the same basic syntax as all these other ggplot um, plots. So, you know, you load in your data, which, this this is a uh, this comes from their vignette. It's kind of a morbid plot, but it's basically like how um, people, you know, based on their class and their sex, whether they survive the you know the crash of the Titanic. And if you just look at the plot, you can see if you were a crew member, you probably did not survive, which is unfortunate. But morbid plot, but also very like you know we can see that immediately. Like crew members did not do well. They ended up most of them ended up in no, which. It's unfortunate. Um, so the way that you know it functions is you specify this geom alluvium call, which is basically these middle parts. That's like the actual flowing part. Um, and you don't have to specify like this width, not position, reverse uh, necessarily. You can just do like what we want to fill on. So this is just filling on, you know, what like class uh, they were, if they were first class, etc. And then you use um, the geom stratum call. Uh, which will basically create these uh, like levels right here, like what they want to split them into, like, you know, you know, like it'll be like class, sex arrived, and then like male, female. And then you you can use this geom text call. That's like where the actual text right here comes from, like male versus female. If you don't specify that geom text call, then like there wouldn't be anything here. They would just be like a box that was empty of text. Um, so that wouldn't be very helpful for interpreting it. Um, yeah, and oh yeah, sorry, I also, um, did not mention like this beginning part, but um, so you specify like you want like what you want the y axis to be, which is like the frequency, like you know, like how many actually survived, and then you specify these axes. So, like axis one is whether they survived or not, axis two is whether they what their sex was, and axis three was class. So, that's how you specify like these different like um, levels, these different strata within like the ggplot. Um, but yeah, 
it's I think it's a nice visualization. And it's just to me, it represents like ggplot, like a lot of people create really cool add ons and extra things that you can do on it. So that's one of the reasons that like, I like using it. Um, yeah, and then um, you can make heat maps very easily with the geom tile call. Um, this one's just kind of like the temperature, literal heat map, you know, the temperature by like these months from this air quality data set. Um, so that can be like, it's just a very quick, you know, geom tile creates it very easily. You can do like a lot of interesting things with geom tile. Um, I've made like a lot of interesting plots using it um, that are kind of, uh, you're using like data that I can't like share here, but um, you know, they're, they're a nice handy tool to have too. Um, so here's kind of more of like an advanced bar plot that you can create. I think one of like one of again like the um, the upsides to ggplot versus sjplot is that you can do something like this, like where it's very heavily modified. Whereas an SJ, sjplot or base R, you're not going to be able to do it as much. But in this one, um, I had some data manipulation before this, and in the code that I share, like you'll you'll be able to see that. But I'm feeding in that data. Um, you know, the y-axis is the percent, the x-axis is this uh, cylinder, and then I'm filling based on carburetor. Um, you know, you want to use this position, like in the geom call, which is similar to the geom bar um, call, but it's a little, little different. Um, but you want to use like position equals dodge, because otherwise these would be stacked on top of each other, which sometimes can be nice. But since I wanted to add text, I didn't. Um, but yeah, you can use like position equals dodge. So they're basically like dodging each other. Um, there's a lot of different options for that position um, call. And then uh, I just added text for like each of these, like just, you know, what I wanted, uh, like the percent for this to be. But um, it's nice because it's just like, you create like a plot where you're not, uh, you're, you're basically comparing like a lot of like, this is like the percent within like more than 20 miles per gallon versus less than 20 miles per gallon. And it can just be like really nice to have that. Um, yeah. And then here's um, kind of a fun plot um, that I did that uh, it it combines. So like the, the other nice thing about ggplot is that you can combine like multiple like data sources um, into one plot. So like say you have like one like like data frame, and then you have like another set of data and you want to combine them, but like you don't want to like actually combine the data frames into one. ggplot's nice because um, you can create like basically one plot and then with like the like, you know, each of these like lines, each, each of these lines of code, like you can add in like more data and it's kind of like self-contained. So I'll kind of go over what this plot is because it's kind of a little more complex. Um, so what I did is I made like a, like a, uh, like mixed effects model, where it's basically like the data is um, the weight of these different chicks um, over time, and then they had four diets. So something like, you know, when you're doing like modeling like this, you want to um, account for like within chick, within, you know, cluster correlation. So that's what like this model is doing. Um, so then I used this, uh, this package called effect um, which basically will output, um, like when you do these interaction models, your, your estimates aren't always super fun to play with, but this effect package is nice because it'll output like the marginal, um, like estimates for, you know, basically like how did time and diet, like how, like did that basically work? Um, so like with it, like on the, like how did that, um, function like on the weight of these chicks? Um, but like, Kind of the point of this is uh, we are, you know, creating this uh, like data frame that's basically telling us like how each of these like subgroupings, like these sub chick um, diet weight or time weight, how that like impacted their uh, weight. So um, anyway, the important part for this is this, you know, the ggplot call. So first I'm just feeding in the chick weight and then I'm just like the actual data, not the model results. And I'm just saying, like, I want the weight on the y-axis, um, x is the time, and then I just want to color by the diet, because there are four diets, and then I want to group by the chick. So that way, like, you can see that these lines are, like, connected. Like, each line represents an individual chick. Um, so that's what that group call does. And then I just create, like, a geom line. So, you know, this is just, if, ignore the black line for now, we can see that, like, each of these, like, plots, it's split by the diet, and each one of these lines represents a chick. Um, so if you wanted, I also, in the code, I have an example of if you just use like this, what the average by like the average weight is by each time point. But if you want to like actually put in the model, you can do another geom line and then you can feed in that data. So as we saw, like 
um, I added like model, like model effects is what I named that data. So we just add in model effects as another data frame. And then the call is pretty similar, like the groupings diet. Y is now fit because in the, the model effects, instead of being named weight, it's just called fit now. Um, but time's the same. And then I made like the line type based on the diet. So that's why they're like dotted like this. And I made the, the lines black. Um, and then down here, we can see like I did a facet grid. So I split it by diet because otherwise this would just be like one plot with all of these four diets overlaid. Um, but I think it's like, it's a fun um, plot. It's not too hard to make. And it just shows you like, you can add in like new um, geome layers with new data. So that way, if you try to combine this model effects data with the chick weight data, it wouldn't go very well. Like I would, I would not recommend it. I wouldn't really know how to structure it quite honestly, but this is nice because you can just add in new data and you don't even have to have like everything be the exact same as far as like naming syntax. Um, you know, like as we can see, like y equals fit wasn't the exact same. It will take whatever you specify first. So that's why it's like named weight. It will take that first. Um, you know, like weight and fit didn't like overlap as far as the naming conventions. Um, so it'll take whatever comes first. That's something to keep in mind. But you can add in new data, which is really cool and nifty, as we can see like in this plot. Um, so one thing I did want to go over um, is how, what's the best way to get your output um, from like, not just ggplot, but just, you know, plots in general in R. Um, so you can, if you're working in RStudio, which I imagine most people will be, um, you can copy paste directly from RStudio. Like you'll create these plots and depending on what you're using, if it's just like an R script or if it's like an R markdown, it'll pop up somewhere and you can just, you know, right click, copy, paste. Um, I've done that before, uh, you know, it's not something I would advise when you're doing, like if it's a presentation, like in this presentation, some of these I copy pasted. Um, but if it's something for like a manuscript or you're presenting, I wouldn't advise it because you're gonna have some issues with the resolution. Um, some plots just like the resolution will be really poor. Um, you're gonna have issues with the size of the plots too. And there's the issue of reproducibility. Um, you know, like if you're just copy pasting, you know, something might change in your code. So your plot will be slightly different next time and it might not be the same plot. So. It's a quick way, but I would not recommend it for anything um, formal. Um, but it is very fast. Like it's, I mean, it's just copy paste. Um, you can output into an HTML, Word doc, or a PDF using um, either R Markdown or Quarto, or you can, I mean, if you're doing like a PowerPoint like this, you can output it into a PowerPoint too. Um, so yeah, the pros of that is really great reproducibility. Uh, the cons is sometimes you have to rerun like your entire R markdown um, to redo a single image, which can be kind of painful. Like if um, someone's like, yeah, can you change like the title? It's like, I can, but now I have to like recreate this HTML, which isn't always fun. I've had that experience quite a bit. You can use this GG save function um, with GG plot objects um, and it'll save it. You have to specify, uh, it'll save it to G uh, JPEG. I almost said ggpeg, <laughs> jpeg, pdf, or png. This one's really nice um, because you can manually specify like the size, like in any like inches, centimeters, millimeters, or pixels. I wouldn't do pixels because I don't really know how that corresponds to actual size, but you know, you can specify that and you can specify the resolution and just bump it up as much as you, uh, as much as it allows you. I think the max is 320. Um, but that's really nice because you'll create like really nice journal quality images and a lot of journals want you to submit like a JPEG or whatever. So you can do it that way and it's really nice. Um, and then the final option, which is kind of similar to the copy paste, you can like open and edit from within RStudio. Um, and you can, there's this export button in the plots pane and you can save it as an image or a PDF. So that's like a little um, more straightforward than using ggsave. I have had mixed uh, success with it in the past. Um, and then you can copy to your clipboard and manually try and uh, change sizing. Um, I think the similar issue, like similar issues to copying, like your reproducibility is not gonna be great. Um, you can, it's it's a step above, but it does take more effort, but I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's my talk. Um, you know, I, I think there's so much you can do in ggplot and sjplot and just R in general. Um, you know, this is not comprehensive whatsoever. Like. There's many, many things um, that you can do in addition, but I hope this was helpful. I know it was a lot, um, but I wanted to go over like a lot of examples with everyone while also kind of reinforcing that 
here is just the kind of standard way of doing it in ggplot or sjplot. And you should be able to make all sorts of cool figures just based with like that, you know, basic knowledge of how it works. Um, but yeah. And then now I know there is something, <laughs> something uh, along the lines of a raffle. Uh, I'm going to kind of turn it over to Lala because <laughs> I'm not super sure on that. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, just make sure you sign the attendance. I just posted the link again on the chat box. Um, for each talk that you attend, you're entered into the raffle for an iPad, a Garmin watch, or wireless headphones, so don't forget to fill that out. Other than that, tonight we have a machine learning in R lecture from 5.30 to 6.30, and tomorrow during lunchtime like today, we have basic, st basic statistics in R. So feel free to join us for any and all of those that appeal to you. But other than that, thank you so much for coming.